So for this, for this freelance panel, it's going to be relatively organic. We do have some some placeholder questions in case it gets awkwardly silent in here. Um, but really, we want to have these excellent freelancers, uh, many great friends of mine through the years, answer as many questions as they can about the freelancing world. A lot of the things that they've learned as small business owners and striking it out on their own, uh, do they have to wear pants, how do you get clients, you know, really any of the you stuff that if you're thinking about getting into freelance or if you're just starting or even if you're a seasoned veteran and you have that thing that's nagging at you uh, that you're having a, a hard time overcoming that hurdle. Uh, I will go ahead and have them introduce themselves, and then I can get started with a couple of questions. And at any point, if you have specific things that you want to, to pivot to talk about, that would be really awesome. So, first. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Drew Poland. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at BMoreDrew, B M O R E D R E W. Um, freelance WordPress developer for a really long time now, close to seven years, maybe a little bit over. Um, specializing in theme and plugin development, and that's about it. <laughs> I'm Tara Clays. Uh, my company's Design TLC, and I also have a joint venture called Nice Work. You can find me on Twitter at design underscore TLC. And I've been working with WordPress for about five or six years um, and freelancing the whole time. So that's my full experience with WordPress. Hi, I'm Andy Stratton. I run a company called Sizable Interactive, which is it's a two-person. We're basically freelancers that run an agency. Um, I've been freelancing since 2005, so I guess 11 years, working on WordPress for 10 years. And you can find me on Twitter at the Andy Stratton, but you're not going to read much because I haven't used it very regularly. But feel free to ping me, and I will get an alert if you have a question. Cool. Uh, so I'd like to start with each of your origin stories. How did you decide to go into freelancing? Because I know that's something that, uh, okay. So we have a recording device here that we'll be able to attempt speaking into. Let's see you first. Go ahead. Uh, but yeah, how, you know, how did you decide to do it to begin with? Because it, it's something that you, uh, you know, makes some of us nervous going out on your own and not having I didn't have a whole lot of choice. Um, I was unemployed at the time and just kind of tried to figure out what I could do. Um, I just moved across country. There's a whole big long story to it, but I, the gist of it is I just moved across country. I had like maybe a thousand bucks to my name and I was like, all right, cool. What can I do now that I did all this and came to nothing? <laughs> um, so I was just like, well, I can build websites. I uh, built some websites for some for a couple small companies, like you know, five, six hundred bucks, just enough to pay the bills really. Um, started doing some more networking, uh, met up with a couple of people who were using WordPress, and I was like, wow, this can really kind of speed up everything I'm doing. Uh, and that just kind of opened a bunch of doors to a lot of things just because WordPress is growing so rapidly. Uh, just being a WordPress developer opens a whole lot of work for you. But that's, that's, you know, that's the whole story, really. Ever since then, I've just been trying to talk at, at things like this as much as possible, release products and services as much as possible, just get yourself out there, really, and that's that'll organically bring you work. If you do good work, you'll always be pretty steady. I'm probably the oldest person up here, but uh, so I have kind of a long history, but I have a background in advertising and marketing, and then um, a lot of my life I've been a mom, so I stayed home, and I'm a fortunate freelance position that my husband was the breadwinner, major breadwinner for the family. So I started out um, as a mom who did a side business in some stationery and graphic design and then built a website for myself using front page. And then some of my stationery clients had businesses and um, I had a physical therapist and I didn't have insurance. So I traded her, you know, a website for physical therapy and followed basically the path if you were here before with Beth. I've kind of followed that learning path where I learned HTML and CSS and and PHP and, and WordPress um, in order to kind of, for each job, I would learn something new. And um, so now I'm no longer just a mom. Now I'm, I'm supporting my family half, half, my husband half and me half. So it's been, a, it's been a great success for me. I was bit by a radioactive spider. 
and woke up with uh, all these WordPress powers. Um, <laughs> so we're talking about origin stories. Anyone who's not a nerd in here won't understand that. Um, so I guess if you go really far back, I was an awkward kid that liked using computers, that learned how to program on, if you recall, if you're of this generation that used to get the free AOL floppy disk, um, or the CD that you could use as like a coaster, because you got them at like, uh, like CompUSA, any of those stores. Um, I used to hack around on AOL all the time and make stuff that would get our account canceled, but it taught me, <laughs> taught me how to program. Um, I used to make jokes and stuff like that in high school on websites for my friends back in the GeoCities, Angel Fire, Tripod, those classic days. Figured out how to get domain names back when it took a week for them to, uh, to get registered instead of like 13 minutes. And kind of got out of that, went to school, went to school for like business and vaguely for computers and towards the end of my career in college, I was like, I don't like all this stuff. I, I think I'm gonna try to make websites. So I continued that self-education. And I worked in the in that field from like 2005 to 2009, I guess, from various places, either internally for companies or eventually I worked at AOL, which was ironic. Um, and then, or I worked for ad.com, which was an AOL like subsidiary and moved into the agency world, saw how some of this stuff worked, worked with companies that were, you know, larger marketing departments working with agencies, which catching the end of, um, what's Beth? Uh, her, her session talking about, you know, starting freelance versus having that experience. That taught me a lot about how to interact with those types of people and those types of companies, which is super, super valuable. And I think that experience was very valuable, but ended up in an agency environment and getting to a point where I was doing so much freelance um, on the side, it became a struggle to figure out what my identity was between the two worlds. And again, some of what Beth had said about her, my personality lends better to working for myself. So I went for that and that's kind of how I got there. How did you find, how did you find <laughs> your, your first clients as a freelancer? First client. So I think my first client, I did a lot of, I mean, I, I don't like saying this because I'm against this, but at the same time, it's going to depend on where you are. I did some free work because it was a passion at the time. Like I was teaching myself how to do it, especially in college. I would do stuff. Let me build you a website because I need to figure it out. Um, and from that, you start to get in touch with people who need stuff where, you know, maybe you charge them a couple hundred bucks to do something that you're figuring out as you do it. And then the next one, I th you do something else. I think the first real project I had was in 2005. I think I was living at my parents' house. So I remember working on it in my bedroom. And it was like a $500 project that I think I would probably charge six figures for now for the amount of work that it was. Like, it was a lot of work. It was like a job, it was a, it was a custom built job board. Like, and I was so stoked to make, I was like 500 bucks, holy shit. Like, um, but yeah, so first client is typically, I was doing stuff for people. Like, hey, if I can make something for you, let me know because then I'll, I'll, I'll be more confident in it. And eventually you start charging money and then you start moving that up. I think that's probably how most freelancers start, you know, you, or if you're learning, you, offer your services and trade like I said you barter but you're learning so you kind of they they get what they get from you as you're learning and and then um, the challenge with that though I'll say is that once you've done something for free or for five hundred dollars when your skills have evolved to a point and you have a portfolio it's then hard to charge ten thousand because you have people who've referred you who paid two thousand so you have to really um, you have to have a lot of confidence, but you also have to be careful on how you work with those early clients and that you let them know that that was a favor for them or that you were learning sort of on their dime, but that now, three years later, your skills are enough that you're not gonna do a $2,000 job for their neighbor that they tell them that they spent 2,000. So I think that's, that's a tricky line to cross because it's great to be able to learn on a project, you know, to be paid even a little bit to learn, but you do have to be careful of that. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everything in the same vein as, as what's already been said. Like, you know, I just kind of threw the word out there and was like, I will literally do anything. I wrote copy. I did, like, SEO stuff for a while. I mean, I would literally do anything. Like, it, the whole goal was, was essentially to, you know, design and develop. But, like, I was literally, again, literally had, like, a thousand bucks to my name when I was like, hey, if you need something web-related, 
or even not, if you just need me to make calls for your business, I'll do that too. I had a client who I built them a website and they ran a storage company. I actually did their delinquency calls for a while <laughs> because I was just like, they were like, what else can you do? I was like, I'm really good on the phone. Like, why don't you, I'll totally be an asshole to your people who won't pay. Like, you need to pay your bill and they paid me on commission. So like, I really had to like dig in. Um, but I, I just literally did anything for a while. And it is kind of hard when you get referrals from people who are like, yeah, this dude built me an awesome website or whatever for like 800 bucks. And then you're, you know, that's two years later, you're like, yeah, that's like five grand. And they're like, we've got like 1200 bucks. And well, sometimes you still have to say yes, <laughs> you know, depending where you're at. All right. I think that's a perfect transition. Uh, uh, so now I'm going to jump forward to the future and say, uh, what are the biggest red flags that uh, you pick out when you have a new client that you've never worked with before? What are things that stand out that you're like, I know this is not going to be a good fit? And uh, how, how do you have those hard conversations? Uh, big red flags are like hesitation, pushiness. Like generally, I want someone to feel comfortable and like confident that I know what I'm doing. And a lot of times that just comes naturally because if you look, and it, I guess it really kind of depends how you get your work, but for me it almost only, almost exclusively comes either referral at this point or through my website. And the reality is, and this applies to everybody too, if someone goes to your website, sees your work, and then hits up your contact form, they turn into a lead at that point, they're basically telling you that they see you as an expert. So you kind of got a good leverage point at that, but if, if you have someone who does that and then they still kind of question everything, that's a big red flag for me. Like, I've had some clients where they have budget and they have everything, but they're still like, what do you think about this? And then they always go the opposite direction. <laughs> that ends up being kind of, it can end up being rather toxic. Um, so just like, you've got to pick up on the subtleties if, if they really truly value that they really think you are an expert and know you're an expert and will value your opinion. Uh, that's a big red flag for me. Yeah, I think at this point for me, um, budget and timing, if someone has an unrealistic expectation that they can have a website in a week, which if you guys build websites, you probably could do a website in a week. We all could, but not when you're working on someone else's because you have to get their input, and that usually is what drags out a job. So um, I actually just came back from a conference and learned a lot about uh, building out your contact form to weed people out, You know, having more, of, um, having more questions to find out how invested they are in their own site, how willing they are to work on their own site, what their budget is, what their timing is. So that's a good way to, before they even become a flag, um, to have them uh, fill out a contact form for you. So I think um, that's probably what I'm going to be doing in the next few weeks. I'm going to let these people in on a little secret. So I highly recommend befriending your local freelancers that do the same stuff that you do like my friend drew because some people will copy and paste the same thing into every local person's contact form and send it to everyone and that's a very quick way to find out who is you know casting a yeah they're just they're fishing for something because they they're trying to get the cheapest quickest stuff or if they actually looked at it. So like there's the person that filled out your contact form, there's the guy that writes Drew that didn't write me, that is super, like read Drew's site, super interested in Drew, feels confident that like he wants to know more. And then there's the guy that pasted it that wrote like, hi Jason, blah, and I'm like, Jason? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so that's one thing. I think one of my biggest red flags, like Tara made a good point, when someone, when someone has an unrealistic idea of like time frame, like you know, I need a I need a fifty thousand dollar website. We need it in three weeks. Really? Like, are you even gonna have a deposit to me within the next seven days? But you need it three weeks from today. Like, how is that gonna? Are you gonna wire me money? Like, and if they're like, no, we'll wire you the money today. We're gonna pay you like a hundred thousand dollars for fifty thousand dollars worth of work. I'm all about that guy. That guy rarely shows up. It's usually no. I got like uh, I got fifteen hundred dollars. I need fifty thousand dollars worth of work. A big red flag for me to add to this is when someone is overly concerned with price before they found out if you're even capable of doing the work. Like when they're, well, how much is this going to cost? And be like, well, I don't know anything about what you need to do, and you, don't, I don't even know if I can do it. Because so when that's what I would call shopping based on price, not based on value. And when people are doing that, now granted, and Drew and I talk about this sometimes. 
sometimes your cupboard's empty and you're working based on price. You're not working based on, you know, there's you know, some of us up here probably have the luxury now that we're not doing that right now, but I totally did that. I've, my, my rate is varied all over the place, especially 10 years ago. Like, like I said, I would have charged, now I would charge six figures for what I did for 500 bucks and I was happy about that 500 back then. So um, I would say anyone who's bringing up price and I don't remember where I want to say I heard this for, I like to attribute stuff. D. Keith Robinson used to have a company um, called Blue Flavor in Washington. And, and I saw him in Washington State, I think in Seattle. And he was like, anytime someone brings up price in the first conversation, I'm out. Because I know that that's, they have a number in their head and it doesn't matter what they, they need done. They're looking for that number. One more thing. One more thought too. Um, if they have come to you and say that they've had several different developers that they've worked with, uh, and it just hasn't gotten right. Um, certainly there are developers that drop off face of the earth and those types of things, but I just took a client who, when I met with them after doing discovery and I saw kind of what the mess was in the back end, they told me, they said something like, um, we've worked with a bunch of different designers and um, here's your deposit. What happens if we change our mind? <laughs> and I've never had that happen before. And I'm working for them actually because it's a challenge for me to be like not the one that they decide they don't want to work with. But that would be a red flag. Yeah. And it's a cool brand. So that's the other thing too is it's not, not necessarily just that you need the work because you need to fill your cupboard, but it's also, is this a really visible um, website, a very fun company that you're going to put in your portfolio? That also would allow me to, I would probably take that job for less than I might for, you know, a, a lawyer or something that's not so interesting. So a beer garden, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> I do, I do both, yeah, I, I do soup to nuts, but I also have um, collaborated with designers and with developers. I've um, sent higher level development um, needs to contractors that I work with. And um, it's, I think if you're starting out as a freelancer, you have to know how to do all of it. You might not be the best designer or the best developer, but if you can build a site from beginning to end, that's helpful. But then as you grow and you do bigger projects, it's great to have that split out because it's very hard to do it all and to be creative when you're also the developer. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm literally like 90% developer. So, you don't want me designing stuff. <laughs> but but living in that space enough, if something needs tweaked or like I need to whip up a layout or something, I can generally do that. Like, you know, it may not be as polished as if I send it to my design guy. But if it's where like, oh, we're launching in the next week and we need to quickly throw together a quick one page, three blocks, like I look at this stuff enough that I can put something clean together that matches what already exists. Uh, but I used to do everything. Um, and it, I also think it depends on like the world you live in. Like I think if you're doing like two, three thousand dollar websites and you're a design developer, you can totally do it start start to finish. Like because your target market isn't looking for this like really, really high end polished look or if they are they just they don't have the budget to do that realistically um, so I have two designers I work with pretty regularly well one pretty regularly one uh, overflow um, how did you find them um, actually stole the one from Andy <laughs> and I think he still work you still he does, does some work with the guy too um, how did you find Ron Craigslist something random it was like yeah it was like and which is like one of those yeah like I think we both had spent a long time, this was when we were both in like a flux of needing a designer, and like I spent a bunch of time on like Behance and, and Dribble and like just randomly this really good designer popped up somehow, um, and that was years ago, I've been working with, with him since, so. So this is, I, I think that's a great question. Um, and I'm thinking back to something that we were talking about earlier when, I don't know, someone up here was talking about something you think you were saying like I would do I did anything I did whatever so I remember my my first business card I don't even know if I have a business card right now which is shameful I guess but uh, my first business card said like Andy Stratton PHP WordPress XHTML CSS JavaScript jQuery it had like 15 things on it and because I was like I can do anything I want all the business send me all the money and uh when I went to WordPress developer, 
I got more work because people knew what to come to me for and I got better at a specific thing. So focusing is a huge, I'm very big uh, to me, be the best at the thing that you do versus being okay at everything. Cause you can, it doesn't, you don't get as much out of the, out of the gate, but the long game for that, at least in my experience has been amazing. Um, and you can command, then you can get to a point where you're commanding more per hour. So I don't know, are, who's, what's the breakdown? Who's freelancer in here? Who is thinking about it? And who, and I guess, who's not? Okay, cool. This is a good group. Ah, get out. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so my, in my experience, when I first went freelance, I was trying to kind of do design, which was, and if you're, if you say you lean more development, it's painful. It's like writing with my left hand, but I'm right-handed. So I can do it, but it looks like I wrote with my left hand. So I would find people like, like Drew's talking about, now I have that guy, but I also have a partner when I say I'm a two-person agency. And we have some subcontractors we work with. So we're, we have a, a solid team, but it's not, you know, we don't have like a company full of 40 people. Um, I pushed on my partner who worked at the same company I was at, when I left, I was like, hey man, if you wanna leave, like you're the other half. Like I'm all code, you're all visual, and we met, we met in the middle with UI development. So I was like, if you can come into that, I can optimize this process so that way when I'm going in and selling a project, you meet a client, like I would go into, pro into meetings about projects and I'd be like, cool, I can do this, we can do that, oh, that's great. I was like, yeah, all I have to do is find a designer and then we can do it. And it was like, that's not a confident sell, like sales pitch in that meeting. They're like, okay, well, how do we know if you can do that and what does it look like? Versus me being able to have a relationship with someone, whether it's someone who's a contractor with you or someone who works you know, as a partner or as a, you know, as a subcontractor to you, that you could say, all right, well, you know, Rob typically charges like $3,000 for this, so I know what that costs. If I add that and it's vague, even if I'm off a little bit, our costs are covered, we got a project, and you continue to build that like synergy from there. But I would, I would also say, like the projects that we do now take like half the time they took five years ago because we know exactly, we're, it's almost, it's as close as you can get to a, what have I been calling it, like a assembly line without it, with it being customized work because everyone's in their silo of expertise, and I find that works really well. I also was thinking about what the definition, sorry, let me just, uh, about what the definition of a freelancer is, which I think is more of a one-person type of shop, whereas when you collaborate, so I've just formed an agency with a designer, um, so I think freelancer, at least you start out, my, in my mind, a freelancer is one person. That's just the way I think about it, so you have to be able to do all of it. That's a good question, and I try for it to literally never get that point. Um, so at the beginning of every project, uh, we do a couple things. We'll do a kickoff where we literally just discuss, we discuss aesthetics or content more importantly, but if content's ready, we try to design around that. Um, and also having a document that just asks them a, a lot of generic questions. And generally I like to get two or three websites that they like and try to find the common denominator between what's what's in there and then match that up with like whatever we talked about on the discovery call and kind of form mentally or, or even just a sketch you know what that's going to look like um, and sometimes that's literally me just sketching on a paper and firing it off into base camp to everybody being like does that sound right about what we talked about okay cool Ron bring it to life I Unless somebody else wants it, you got to drill down on that for me. Unless somebody else wants to answer that, you've got to drill down into that question. Like, be more specific.
Sure, and I guess that makes more sense uh, contextually. Um, I mean, the best thing is to have a, con a frank conversation about it. Like, hey, I think he this is going to work best. Here's why. Um, and hear both sides of that and, and come together, like, either in the middle ground or pull to one side. Does that make sense? Terms of like, and, and literally like, that, and literally like custom post types and things like yeah. that. Like you know, that all gets mapped out yeah, along so with you don't put down that aside the design. Yeah. You know, essentially. Project. Right, because generally you have content beforehand. So in my mind, I can see a site map, or we can work on a site map, and I can make all right, cool. These are blog posts. We need this. We need this. So we start here, home page. Now design an archive page for that. Design a, a con single content page for that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Plus they both In terms of like, yeah. Too far off. In terms of pure aesthetic, like my designer tends to, he, he can move around, but you, if you look at everything, you just line it all up, you're gonna see he has this like big white space, dramatic colors, like you're gonna see a, a similar design between each of it, even being able to read in the different areas. Your question maybe also is related to sort of client service and project management. So as freelancers, we're doing, we're wearing all of these hats. I have a background in advertising where I was an account manager, so I you know, kind of knew how to talk to a client. But you, you do sometimes get in a position where, you, where they're saying that they don't agree with something that you're showing them, and you have to say, this is what I say, you've hired me to do this for you because this is what I do, and I know what I'm doing, and I have, an exp I have experience in it. Ultimately, you're paying me to do that, and it's your choice if you, if you don't want to go the direction that I'm recommending to you. you know, we can keep working together, and I'm happy to bend and do it exactly as you want, but I'm telling you that I don't think that's the right way to go. Um, and that does happen sometimes, but usually we can find some place in the middle and I'll pick my battles, right? If they want this to be orange and I made it red, you know, I mean, that's, that's an aesthetic thing. It doesn't really matter. If they want, um, I have a, a lawyer I'm working with right now who sent me an email that he's going to be incessantly editing like for the next month until we launch. And, you know, I'll say, I think that's ridiculous. You know, you, you're 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 getting too detailed, too caught in the weeds, changing about us to about and back and forth. You know, that's that's a silly battle. More significant battles, I'll put my foot down more and, and really really sell it. You're paying for it. That's change exactly order. right. That's a change order. That's what you say. So they're paying the bill, and it's up to them ultimately. I was going to say, come on up. Please sit next to me up here. Um, that's what I was going to say. Um, so, and it, again, me abstracting what your question seemed to be was more, it seemed to be like, how do you, how do you manage and resolve conflicts in the situation? And I always abstract things down to a relationship level, not just necessarily business, because in anything, even going back to what Tara said about the, we've gone through 18 people. Like if you went on a date with me and I was like, oh my gosh, girls keep leaving me. Hi, like, <laughs> why do they keep leaving you? Like, that's the question that you should ask as the freelance. Why are these other people that are my peers unwilling to work with you anymore? Why are they disappearing without talking to you? So coming over to this, I think of this as conflict resolution. So expectations management is the, I could not be good at what I do and still do well with expectations management, I've found. And it's, you'll hear it a lot, and it, but it's, un, it's unbelievable and it protects both sides. So for us, we'll have a, we, mean, we will have a contract, like she said, where, you know, homepage design, three revisions we do, and the way that we work, we'll do an, in, an initial concept based on our discovery conversations. And if they don't like that concept, we'll do a second one for free. I don't do the we do three concepts for it because the first one is what the client talked about, the second one is what the designer wants, and the third one is a Frankenstein from another project that's fulfilling a, contra a contractual obligation. So, and I've seen it from agencies that charge six figures and from agencies that charge like $5,000. So that's a huge piece of it. The other piece, I think Tara made a good point about picking your battles. Um, 
we've got a client right now that, I mean, technically they owe us over $20,000 in late fees. And at this point, the project's gone on for two years. I just want it to launch. So when they're like, can you move the button left? I'm like, yeah, it's left. You ready to launch? Like, that's, that's 30 seconds for me. Let's launch. So, um, yeah, you, you took the steam out of me, but that's awesome. No, 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 that's good. I love it. Developers disappear too. Oh, yeah, that's what I said. As much as I hate to say it, it's more of a problem. Oh, that way. Is that we drop off the face of the planet more than I think designers do. Right, right. But I hear so many stories of developers. You know, I mean, I've had so many designers come to me saying, you know, my developer drops off the face of the planet. I've got this job. Can you do it? You know, and those sorts of things. So so I'm curious how how you guys kind of deal with that or if you even have to deal with that in in your squad. Yeah, I mean, thank you know, thankfully, I've been really lucky and like, you know, uh, originally my answer was going to be to just keep them so busy they can't disappear. And that kind of killed two birds with one stone. And But it's kind of true, too. Like, you know, I've worked with a handful of designers, but I always, for the past couple of years, I've always come back to the same guy. And, you know, we just mesh well and his price aligns right and I know where to put him. Uh, he's fairly reliable, doesn't, you know, is, is good on the phone with people. Like, I've just, I think I've been really lucky. So it's almost hard for me to answer that, you know, because I really haven't been through the whole gamut. But I've also witnessed and seen exactly what you talk about. Because as a, as a developer, I see it all the time. We're like, the other half of this thing disappeared. Can you, can you build this? Um, so, yeah, I think just, like, you know, being clear about expectations. And, like, if you have a good relationship with someone, like, and I, I assume I have a good relationship with this person, I, you know, I get an invoice it gets paid like that's that's a big thing um my assumption is if they do ever you know go to work somewhere or something they would hopefully give me a heads up <laughs> and i would have time to find somebody else and in which case i don't even know where to start i'd start all back at square one being like somebody help me <laughs> are your designers client facing do you or do you sort of yeah i'm really transparent about it i'm like ron does his own thing like he has his own clients sometimes he brings stuff to me um but we're two we're two independent people everything runs through me uh, I cut him a check that way it's more seamless for the client like you just send one invoice you're not trying to go who gets what who gets this who gets what milestone um, I run everything as it's, it's my project so if he brings a project to me I, I turn the table and let him run the whole thing too so uh, fairly transparent about about that I mean even when I'm, I'm talking to someone who has looked at my site um, and maybe hasn't stumbled upon theirs or whatever because they do have you know a link here or there to being like hey check out my designers portfolio um, I'll be like go check their stuff out like you know here's their web address and realistically they could they could disappear at that point and engage a project with them and I would never know about it but it's never happened so that I know of. I was gonna say I have something to add so I'm, I was trying to think of a good response for that because I've I've wedged my way out of it but I was in it and I think and then also hearing some of the stuff that Drew said made me think of some stuff so as a as a developer if you want designers to come to you with work don't be the guy that disappears like I had a I remember when I first started making a very significant hourly rate I only got to that rate because a designer who was charging that rate came to me. It was like, can you do this? And I did it. And she was like, oh, my God, you did it. You did it on time. I can talk to you. You didn't disappear. And I was like, yeah, that's the baseline. I was like, I didn't even do that good of a job on this. Like, I, I rushed on it, and I did it in my spare time. And she was like, no, you're amazing. I have so much. I just want to send you everything. So as a developer, just not sucking. Yeah, that helps a lot, yeah. <laughs> You're going to be fine. Um, 
so and again expectations management as a designer if you want the develop if you want someone who isn't sucking who's not going to run away on you paying right away oh anyone who pays me I have clients that are on retainer that will pay with a credit card the day I send them the invoice and I jump when I see their e their their emails the client that's now on two years two years twenty thousand dollars forgiven in late fees all this other stuff I'll see when I can get to it like you guys you guys aren't rushing for me and it's not to be rude it's just a priority thing so paying immediately like be like dude I got skin in the game put yours in there's that um, as, a, as a designer as well as understanding on both ends and this kind of comes back to your question earlier too about oh if you're on both sides what should you focus on if you're if you're a developer and you can't do enough basic CSS to make something look clean because you're styling a widget figure get get to that point like so that you don't have to engage someone for that if you don't need to um, and so that you understand what the designers are doing and have a respect for the craft that they have that they're performing as well as if you're a designer understand what sucks and what isn't possible from a development perspective or what might be complex and what might be not and don't surprise someone so coming to someone telling them you have five thousand dollars and then telling them that there's actually thirty thousand dollars worth of work that guy's gonna probably disappear when some good paying project comes in uh, not that they should you should honor your obligations but at the same time it's like a free-for-all sometimes so those are those are the things I'd add so Is that a three or, or is there a fourth question? Uh, oh, wait, no, or no, or no, no. So we're picking the hardest one? Is yeah, that or it sounds like some of these are kind of related. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I mean, I'm remi I connected to your question when you asked it. So <laughs> about charging for scoping a project. I have and I haven't. And it, it again, that's, you have this, this kind of, gr this bell curve of what projects are like. So, so I had a project last year, or early this year, that started last year. That's the biggest project I've ever done in my life. I don't want to do it again. Um, but we, we did a two-month discovery phase just to scope it and to price it. And that alone was tens of thousands of dollars. And it required me to go fly to on site, have like eight-hour meetings, multiple days throughout the week. That I'm charging for, or I'm just not doing it. <laughs> like, um, but there's been times where you know we're, we're scoping a project right now for a nonprofit in DC that's gonna be sizable. And I would go down there for a day for free because I want the project, like I really want it. So it varies and it's also, and I have the time right now. If I was amidst that and I was working seven days a week on that other project, I'd be like, eh. And so it becomes a cost benefit trade off. Um, I mean, granted, if you need, I would, I would go find other work if you had to do the discovery for two months, like full time two months for discovery on some ma like mega project. Before you pass that, just name a couple of your favorite tools that you use for like contract generation or project management tools, timekeeping. I've I've over the years compiled my own templates for contracts, okay. um, which I've used. I can't think of anything online. I know Drew's going to have a good answer for proposals um, specifically. Outside of that, project management, 
we usually base it on the client. Some clients only want to use email. Some like Basecamp. Basecamp is kind of a standard. And then internally, we use Slack. OK, I'll, ask, I'll answer Chris's question about sort of setting yourself self up as a freelancer, how to do estimating contracts, business license, all those things. Um, there are some great resources for that. I will pitch, uh, Carrie Dills is coming out with a book in a few months called Five Steps to Freelancing, and I believe that will cover a lot of those things in terms of setting yourself up as an LLC, everything from that very beginning thing to um, tools, project management tools, um, doing discovery, how to charge, how to set your rate, all those kinds of things. So I would encourage you to look for some resources like that. There are some websites. There's also a conference coming up, I think, in April, the Freelancers Conference in Ohio. You can look that up as well. Um, and then as far as uh, project management tools, I because I'm a small shop, I have an assistant who works for me. Um, I use Todoist with her because it's very single project um, I have a lot of clients, she works on them, so every time I get an email, I can shoot it into Todoist and, and pass it on to her. For larger projects, I use Teamwork, which is similar to Basecamp, but it's a little bit less expensive, actually, and I, I really love it. It's, it's working really well for us. I use that both uh, for my own company as well as for NiceWork, my, um, my joint venture. So um, I use those a lot. And then I use Toggle. I've tried every time tracker that there is out there. I can tell you I used Harvest for a long time. Um, I just switched to Toggle. I like the interface much better. It shows you what project you're working on, whereas Harvest, I would be logging time that I thought was for one client, and then I'd go back the next week to, to bill my time, and it wasn't tracking to the right client. So. Uh, toggle also integrates really well with things like Gmail. If you use Gmail, you can just click start timer when you're in there and you can go pull your reports and um, you I don't think, I think there's a pro version where you can invoice through it, but I use QuickBooks anyway. So, um, so if you're looking for a time tracker, I would really suggest using Toggle. I'm a big tool person. I have written some blog posts about that, tools and Chrome extensions and all that. I, I'm kind of a junkie for that kind of thing. So. Yeah, so kind of similar. I, I kind of, I don't know, I like tools. <laughs> Anything that'll like save and automate time is, is awesome. And Harvest actually, just like two weeks ago, you can actually select a project now. It, yeah, it's like they've revamped a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, but Harvest, you can take All right, well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't track time. Like, it's literally like once a month I'll track time yeah. for like 10 hours just because I do everything flat fee um, pretty much. Like, I just, it's. I will literally, the client will win all day long because I will do like eight hours of work and be like, yep, didn't track any of it. <laughs> and then be like, how much was that? I don't know, five hours. And then, you know, you just, you just got three hours of work for free from me. Um, so in terms of provo proposals, I have ran through making my own templates and pages, like making them in, in every form and shape. Illustrator, I've tried everything. I've used Quote Robot. I have used like 30 different online, like, plug and play and generate. Uh, there is one that just came out called Nusi. N-U-S-I-I. -I, I think it's .com. Uh, it's a little expensive, like 50 bucks a month to get, there's a free version, but it, it says like powered by Nusi or something, and you can't plug your logo in. Those two things are kind of killer for me. Um, but it's, it's awesome. It looks really, really clean, and it's very, very easy to use. Uh, the guy who started is really, really responsive. Like I signed up to randomly found it through like a podcast, uh, I had a question, and the guy who built the whole thing and, and started it emailed me back and was like, do this, this, this. Also, I built this feature in. Go ahead. Like, So so there's a lot of room there, and I think it's growing pretty quickly. It's catching on fire. Um, in terms of contracts, um, similar, you stole my wind, but I'm actually working on a book called Zen Freelancing, a guide to a six-figure lifestyle business. I'm gonna The whole first chapter is literally going to be like contracts, et cetera, but if you want something actionable right now, there is a talk by Mike Montero called Fuck You Pay Me. Um, he, he talks about contracts. And his guy, I can't remember. He says the name of his, his lawyer's website. He has a bunch of blog posts. I've kind of regurgitated those on zenfreelancing.com about, like, uh, project pauses and stuff like that that you can add on to your contract. But there is an open source contract. Um, Andy Clark, yes. Uh, Andy, search Andy Clark, C L A R K E. Yeah, I can't. I, I actually, that's like mine is like this Frankenstein morph of that. I've always used because I had like, 
a contract written and it was like an expensive waste of time but there is an open source contract by andy clark that is awesome and you can just kind of plug the things you want into it and expand it but it's your basic like i'm gonna do this you're gonna pay me here's how long it's gonna take we both sign and go on our ways I can point to. Go ahead. Um, I just had uh, another resource because yeah. uh, we were talking about something. We went to Germany in the spring, and then every single there would be something called Spark and it's across the nation. Oh, so no matter where you are, the, 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 the major cities, it was a group. So I'm, I'm the co-leader of the GC uh, group. And it's good because I always have kids that go like that. Uh -huh. but, <laughs> Is there Freelancers Union is the website to look up, okay? Freelancerunion.org. Yeah. Um, you guys uh, obviously had a great job and you've been doing it for a while. Um, one of the things that I found out with like some of the smaller guys like myself is I've heard a lot of different kinds of people say, you know, you never compete over price, you always compete over quality. Well, how do you set that standard so that you like know I'm not gonna bend for a two hundred dollar job when it really should cost you two thousand dollars? Well, I think that um, it depends on where you are in your trajectory, right? Like we've all done work for free or for very little money because we had to take the job. So I think you try to, you start out setting your price higher and then you might have to lower it if they fight you or if you feel like you're not gonna get, get the job otherwise if it's, if it's something that you really wanna work on. But it's a decision you have to make based on, based on the opportunity that's there and if it's gonna give you something to put in your portfolio or experience that you're going to uh, increase your skills so that on the next job you can charge more. So it just depends on where you are and at some point you just have to have the confidence to say I'm worth $100 an hour instead of 50 and then you start doing that and then people pay that. So it's a lot of it is your projection of how you um, of how you represent yourself. So I also wanted to I wanted to comment on something that you said because it's something that I've been thinking a lot about which is free hours and tracking your time. A lot of us, when we are freelancers and we're just working for ourselves, um, I know I perceive my time as being sort of like free because I think I'm not paying somebody for it. It's just my time. Like if I'm up till midnight instead of nine working on solving a problem, it doesn't really cost me anything. And when you say that to somebody who's got an agency, they look at you like you've got six heads. But it really is a mindset shift, and you can't really um, change that mindset until you really start tracking your time. And that's really hard to remember to do, something to work on. But if you're starting out or if you're as a freelancer and you're not doing that, I encourage you to because I will fix – fixed price my contracts thinking oh it's going to take me 30 hours and then now that I'm actually tracking my time it takes me 75 hours and I'm like man I've been really losing money so track your time even if it's just so you know how much it's taking you I wanted to add back to your to your question um, probably 2006 when I was still working full-time I went I got the company I worked for sent me to like my first web conference and I was like, oh, these are my people. And I go and I, you know, I was hanging out with the speakers and stuff somehow. It was, I think it was called like the Webmaster Jam Session. I think it was in Atlanta. It might have been in Atlanta. Atlanta has a cool aquarium. Um, no offense, Baltimore, but it was pretty cool. Um, and I remember watching this, you know, this guy in this cool flannel shirt 
holding a moleskin on stage being like, it's about finding the right client. It's about finding the right client. And I'd be like, well, how do I find that guy? Because I'm sitting there being like, I don't, I'm charging all kinds of different rates, all kinds of different people. I don't know what I'm doing, blah, 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 blah. And it's totally, I'll sit here in the flannel shirt and say it's totally about finding the right client. <laughs> but that process is a pain in the ass. And that's not what they say up here when you're at the, when you've got the fancy designer who makes six figures a year working for himself, doing, speaking at, at conferences, being like, it's about the right, the right client. It's totally about the right client. Like every relationship is about the right other half of that relationship, but there are a lot of duds on the way to finding those people. So for me, and this is something that Drew and I have talked a lot about, I hustle, like, and I don't mean that in a case of like, I'm like lying to people. I mean it in a case of like, I work like crazy. And one of the ways that I was able to get, other than being able to make relationships where like the designer was like, oh, I charge 125 an hour. What do you charge? And I was like, I, 125 an hour, <laughs> like 60. That's what I was charging. And I was like, oh, wow. It was like that $500, that first $500 project. And um, so making that connection was great. But an another way that I was able to organically bring my rates up was to be as good as I could be at what I do at the rate I was at and get so busy that new work, I was happy to turn away at the rate I was working at. So let's say I was working at $50 an hour. And I'm, I'm like, holy shit, I got too much work. And someone's like, hi, I need a project. Yeah, I'm 75 an hour. They're like, okay, yeah. cool, come on in. And the, the shittiest client I have at 50 gets to go out or they go up to 75. And then that starts to move up and then you get to that 75. And then everyone's at 75, the next person comes in, you're 85, you're not, you're 100. And they're like, no, 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 that's fine, man, because if you're going to pay the same as these people, I have, I'm good. I got 40 hours a week, or I've got the most I can do. And then when you get those, you move up to 100, and then you're getting people like, you, then at, what I used to do, especially for clients that did a lot of work for me or were working with me regularly, I was like, listen, I've been at $100 an hour for the last four months now, and I've got almost a full boatload, and I love you, thank you for being with me, but I got to move you up because it's hard to prioritize your work. You're at 50. And I'm literally, I can work half with these other people. So I'd like, and even sometimes with them, I'd be like, you give me a lot of work, let's do 75. Which isn't, because you're, you're, it's also at that point, I'm used to working with them, whatever. And these are just example numbers. Whatever your numbers are, they are. So that, and then as you're doing that, you know, you've created a level of scarcity for yourself, for new clients, that you're, you're starting to funnel in only the right people. And you're, then at that, you start learning like I said, like the warning, like warning signs and warning signs for people could be different for everyone. For a lot of agencies that we sub to, like we'll do a lot of production work for larger agencies. Apparently they don't have filters because a lot of times their projects are like, whoa, we need this in two weeks. Like I've had people come with stuff for like Microsoft and be like, I need this in two weeks. And I'd be like, that's not even possible. I'd be like, no. I was like, I'd love to take your money, but it's, I won't even finish. That's not possible. Okay, we'll, we'll come back on the next one. We'll find someone else. Three weeks later, they're like, what's your availability like? And I'm like, well, what's the project? Like, Same one, just a longer timeline. And I'm like, really? Because it would have been done now if we started then. But now it's gonna. Now you're at like a six-week cycle instead of a three-week cycle because you needed it in two. So. You have a, Drew, did you have a, we have a few minutes left. I saw this hand over here. So we can get this question in and then. Yeah, let's, let's get a few more. Yeah. Tell people, you know, we 
should work with me because I'm responsible, because I get the work done on time, because I get the work done on budget. Um, and, and then you need to kind of meet that criteria every time you do it. It's, you know, it's about relationships, again. It's about relationships and managing, managing expectations. And if you, you know, pretend like you're a lawyer or pretend like you're a doctor, doctors don't haggle over prices. Lawyers don't have haggle over prices. You're either paying me what I'm worth or you get the check and I will eventually have it. All right, well, so we have a few more minutes. Do we have any more questions? I usually just tell them I can't start for a couple of months and sometimes I'll drag them out and say I can't really get started on your project for two months but I can give you a content outline so that you can start working on what on something that you can provide so that we can roll out faster when we start so and if it's a small project that I don't really want then I will hand it off to you know I will recommend someone else to take it yeah No, I, I definitely, I, I won't start working with them till we have a contract or a proposal. So uh, I will say this is what we can do, and if they say okay, great, then I send them a proposal, and a contract. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> All right, um, I would say I do something similar. Uh, getting back to me saying like, I hustle. Sometimes I'll say, okay, it's twice as much. Do you want to do it? And if someone says yes, I'm like, all right, we're working the weekend. <laughs> but I like, I mean, I, right now at least in my life, I like that. Like I like when those, I consider those like winning the lottery. Like that's awesome. It's also an opportunity in terms of where you are. For me right now, it's like let me make twice as much on a project. Five years ago, it would be how do I get my rate up and pull these better people in? Because someone who's like, Someone who says, I need this, you're telling me you don't have time, I'm willing to pay you more than you normally get paid, or let's say I was working at lower rates than, than average for what I'm doing, I'm gonna pay you what you're worth. I want the guy that pays me what I'm worth, and sometimes I'll work, you know, I'll work my weekends or I'll pull a 12-hour day to, because I know what I'm worth. And I think at the, at the bottom line, there's two elements to that. There's demand what you're worth, but be worth something too. Like, don't just, you know, don't be, like, get better. Like, the recip uh, recursive self-improvement is huge in this. Even for me, uh, going back to the question about developers and doing design and stuff, like, Sketch is starting to become a standard. We bought it. My designers use, my designers use it all the time. I got to learn it because one day I'm going to need to get into it, and I, it's, hopefully it's not the day that I need it that I learn it but it's, it's a necessity. I'm not gonna be able to get away. And also I think at a certain point, regardless, everything's going JavaScript. So not that I don't know JavaScript, but in terms of like almost throughout server side JavaScript paired with that, like it's, it's coming. It's like- If I was to start from scratch and learn development today, I would, I would uh, yeah, if I was to start from scratch and learn development, I just woke up and I said, you know what? I'm gonna learn how to program. Uh, JavaScript, very, very heavy JavaScript, node, backbone, like vanilla JavaScript, fuck it, learn jQuery, like learn everything, <laughs> you know, put PHP to the side for a second, like PHP, we will always have work as PHP developers, but I think as, as like front facing web people in general, we're going to see this huge shift towards JavaScript. I mean, I know he said something to the effect of that, but I hope I didn't regurgitate. I think, yeah, I think it's knowing PHP is valuable, but I think knowing PHP is going to start to become, hey, I have this thing I need, I need work on. It's going to become, it's going to become. I don't think it's ever going to quite be cold fusion, but it's going to be. You know, some people are like, hey, we got a cold fusion app, and we need someone to maintain it. Every, you know, there's always going to be some. There's if you, if I mean, if you do cold fusion and you're good at it, there's work out there for it, but. Nobody wants it. All right, all right, guys, we are at time. We have a torch time. Uh, I assume that we'll all be at lunch.